Diabetes mellitus, chapter 49 from the Lewis textbooks, a review from class. Insulin is a hormone produced by the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas. Normal endogenous insulin secretion is that in the first hour or two after meals, insulin concentration rises rapidly in the blood and they peak at about one hour. After carbohydrate absorption from the GI tract is complete and during the night, insulin concentrations are low and fairly constant, with a slight increase at dawn. Insulin promotes glucose transport from the bloodstream across the cell membrane to the cytoplasm of the cell. The skeletal muscles and adipose tissue, now they have specific receptors for insulin and are considered insulin-dependent tissues. Insulin is required to unlock these receptor sites, which allows the transport of glucose into the cells and used for energy. The rise in plasma insulin after meal stimulates storage of glucose as glycogen in the liver and muscle, and it inhibits gluconeogenesis, enhances fat deposit of adipose tissue, and increases protein synthesis. The fall in insulin level during normal overnight fasting facilitates the release of stored glucose from the liver, protein from muscle, and fat from adipose tissue. Other tissues from the brain, liver, and blood cells do not directly depend on insulin for glucose transport, but do require an adequate glucose supply for normal function. Although liver cells are not considered insulin-dependent tissues, insulin receptor sites on the liver facilitate the hepatic uptake of glucose and its conversion to glycogen. Glucagon, epinephrine, growth hormone, and cortisol are counter-regulatory hormones that work to oppose the effects of insulin. These hormones increase blood glucose levels by stimulating glucose production and output by the liver and by decreasing the movement of glucose into the cells. The counter-regulatory hormones in insulin usually maintain blood glucose levels within the normal range by regulating the release of glucose for energy during food intake and periods of fasting. Type 1 diabetes is an immune-mediated disease caused by an autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells, which is the site of insulin production. In type 1 diabetes, the islet cell autoantibodies are responsible for beta cell destruction and are present for months to years before the onset of symptoms. Symptoms of type 1 diabetes develop when a person's pancreas can no longer produce sufficient amounts of insulin to maintain a normal glucose level. Once this occurs, the onset of symptoms is usually rapid and patients present with impending or actual ketoacidosis. The patient usually has a history of recent and sudden weight loss as well as polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia. The patient with type 1 diabetes requires insulin from an outside source, which is known as exogenous insulin, in order to sustain life. Without insulin, the patient will develop diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a life-threatening condition resulting in metabolic acidosis. Patients with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes may experience a remission or honeymoon period for about 3 to 12 months after treatment is initiated. During this time, the patient requires very little injected insulin because the beta cell insulin production remains sufficient for glucose control. But eventually, as more beta cells are destroyed and blood glucose levels increase, the honeymoon period ends and the patient will require insulin on a permanent basis. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas usually continues to produce some endogenous, which is self-made insulin. But the insulin that is produced is insufficient for the needs of the body, is poorly used by the tissues or both. The presence of endogenous insulin is a major distinction between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, there is an absence of endogenous insulin. Although the genetics of type 2 diabetes is not yet fully understood, it is likely that multiple genes are involved. Genetic mutations can lead to insulin resistance and a higher risk for obesity and have been found in many people with type 2 diabetes. Individuals with first degree relative with the disease are 10 times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. There are several major metabolic abnormalities that have a role in type 2 diabetes. Insulin resistance is a condition in which body tissues do not respond to the action of insulin. This is because insulin receptors are unresponsive to the action of insulin and or insufficient in number. Most insulin receptors are located on the skeletal muscle, fat, and liver cells. When insulin is not properly used, the entry of glucose into the cell is impeded which results in hyperglycemia. In the early stages of insulin resistance, the pancreas responds to high blood glucose by producing greater amounts of insulin if the beta cell function is normal. 
This creates a temporary state of hyperinsulinemia that coexists with hyperglycemia. Another factor in the development of type 2 diabetes is a marked decrease in the ability of the pancreas to produce insulin. As the beta cells become fatigued from the compensatory overproduction of insulin or when beta cell mass is lost, the underlying reason why the beta cells fail to adapt is unknown, but it may be linked to the adverse effects of chronic hyperglycemia or high levels of circulating free fatty acids. Another factor is inappropriate glucose production by the liver. Instead of properly regulating the release of glucose in response to blood levels, the liver does so in a haphazard way that doesn't correspond to the needs of the body at the time. Another factor is altered production of hormones and cytokines by adipose tissue, known as adipokines. These are secreted by adipose tissue and appear to play a role in glucose and fat metabolism and are likely to contribute to the type 2 diabetes. Adipokines are thought to cause chronic inflammation, which is a factor involved in insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. The two adipokines believed to affect insulin sensitivity or adiponectin and lepitin. Individuals with metabolic syndrome are at an increased risk for development of type 2 diabetes. Components that characterize metabolic syndrome include elevated glucose levels, abdominal obesity, elevated blood pressure, high levels of triglycerides, and decreased levels of high-density lipoproteins. An individual with three of the five components is considered to have metabolic syndrome. Overweight individuals with metabolic syndrome can prevent or delay the onset of diabetes through a program of weight loss and regular physical activity. The disease onset in type 2 diabetes is usually gradual. Patients may go for years with undetected hyperglycemia that might produce few, if any, symptoms. Many cases are diagnosed on routine lab testing or when patients undergo treatment for another condition and an elevated glucose or hemoglobin A1c levels are found. Individuals with diagnosed prediabetes are at an increased risk for the development of type 2 diabetes. Persons with prediabetes usually do not have symptoms, but long-term damage to the body, especially the heart and blood vessels, may already be happening. It's important to encourage patients to undergo screening and for the nurse to provide education about managing risk factors for diabetes. Patients with prediabetes can take action to prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes. Those with prediabetes should have their blood glucose and hemoglobin A1c levels tested regularly and should monitor for symptoms of diabetes such as polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia. Maintaining a healthy weight, exercising regularly, and eating a healthy diet have all been found to reduce the risk of developing prediabetes. Women with gestational diabetes are at a higher risk for needing cesarean delivery and their babies have an increased risk for perinatal death birth injury, and neonatal complications. Women who are at high risk for gestational diabetes should be screened at the first prenatal visit. Those at high risk include women who are obese, are of advanced maternal age, and have a family history of diabetes. Women with an average risk for gestational diabetes are screened with an oral glucose tolerance test at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. Most women with gestational diabetes have normal glucose levels within six weeks postpartum. Conditions that may cause diabetes can result from damage to, injury to, interference with, or destruction of the beta cell function in the pancreas. Some of the examples here are listed after Cushing syndrome. There are medications that can induce diabetes in some people, and those medications are listed here starting with corticosteroids. Diabetes caused by medical conditions or medications can resolve when the underlying condition is treated or the medication is discontinued. Because the onset of type 1 diabetes is rapid, the initial symptoms are usually acute. The classic symptoms are polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. The osmotic effect of glucose produces the symptoms of polydyspnea and polyuria. Polyphagia is a consequence of cellular malnourishment when insulin deficiency prevents utilization of glucose for energy. Weight loss may occur because the body cannot get glucose and turns to other energy sources such as fat and protein. Weakness and fatigue may result because body cells lack needed energy from the glucose. The clinical symptoms of type 2 diabetes are often nonspecific, although it's possible that an individual with type 2 diabetes will experience some of the classic symptoms with type 1. Some of the more common symptoms associated with type 2 diabetes are fatigue, recurrent infections, 
recurrent vaginal yeast or candida infections, prolonged wound healing, and visual changes. The diagnosis of diabetes mellitus is made through one of four methods, and their methods and their criteria for diagnosis include hemoglobin A1c of 6.5% or higher, fasting plasma glucose level of 126 or higher, two-hour fasting glucose level of 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher, and that's during an oral glucose tolerance test with a glucose load of 75 grams. If a patient presents with a hyperglycemic crisis or clear symptoms of hyperglycemia with a random plasma glucose level of 200 or higher, repeat testing is not done. Otherwise, the hemoglobin A1c, the fasting plasma glucose, or the two-hour plasma glucose level should be confirmed by repeat testing to rule out lab error. There are factors that can cause a falsely elevated values, and that includes recent severe restrictions of dietary carbohydrate, acute illness, medications like contraceptives and corticosteroids, and restricted activities such as bed rest. A patient with impaired GI absorption or has recently taken acetaminophen may also have false negative test results. The hemoglobin A1c reflects the amount of glycosylated hemoglobin as a percentage of total hemoglobin. The amount of hemoglobin that is glycosylated depends on the blood glucose level. When blood glucose levels are elevated over time, the amount of glucose attached to the hemoglobin molecule increases. This glucose remains attached to the red blood cell for the life of the cell, which is approximately 120 days. Diseases that affect red blood cells include iron deficiency anemia or sickle cell anemia and can influence the hemoglobin A1c level and should be considered when looking at those test results. Hyperglycemia in the morning may be due to the Samoji effect. A high dose of insulin produces a decline in blood glucose levels during the night. As a result, counter-regulatory hormones like glucagon, epinephrine, growth hormone, cortisol are released. This stimulates lipolysis, gluconeogenesis, and glycogenolysis, which in turn produce rebound hyperglycemia. The danger of this effect is that when blood glucose levels are measured in the morning, hyperglycemia is apparent and the patient may increase the insulin dose. If a patient is experiencing morning hyperglycemia, checking the blood glucose levels between 2 and 4 for hypoglycemia will help to determine if the cause is the Samoji effect. The patient may report headaches on awakening and may recall having night sweats or nightmares. A bedtime snack, a reduction in the dose of insulin, or both can help prevent the Samoji effect. The dawn phenomenon is also characterized by hyperglycemia that is present on awaking. It has been suggested that two counter-regulatory hormones, growth hormone and cortisol, excreted in increased amounts in the early morning are responsible. The dawn phenomenon affects a majority of people with diabetes and tends to be the most severe when growth hormone is at its peak in adolescence and young adulthood. Careful assessment is required to document the Samoji effect or dawn phenomenon because the treatment for each differs. The treatment for the Samoji effect is less insulin. The treatment for the dawn phenomenon is an increase in insulin or an adjustment in administration time. Again, the patient is asked to measure and document bedtime, glucose, their nighttime between 2 and 4 a.m., and their morning fasting blood glucose levels. If the pre-dawn levels are less than 60 and signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia are present, the insulin dosage should be reduced. If the 2 to 4 a.m. blood glucose level is high, the insulin dosage should be increased. In addition, the patient should be counseled on appropriate bedtime snacks. Self-monitoring of blood glucose is a critical part of diabetes management. By providing a current blood glucose reading, the primary advantage is that it enables the patient to make decisions regarding food intake, activity patterns, and medication dosages. It also produces an accurate record of daily glucose and trends and alerts the patient to an acute episode of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Self-monitoring of blood glucose is recommended for all insulin-treated patients with diabetes. The frequency of monitoring depends on several factors, including the patient's glycemic goals, the type of diabetes that the patient has, the medication regimen, the patient's ability to perform the test independently, and their willingness to test. Continuous glucose monitoring occurs through sensors inserted under the skin. The sensor data is sent continuously to the insulin pump transmitter, and the transmitter sends data to the insulin pump through wireless technology. 
Because errors in monitoring techniques can cause errors in management strategies, comprehensive patient teaching is essential. People with type 1 diabetes often test their blood glucose before meals. This is because many patients use insulin pumps or multiple daily injections and base the insulin dose on the carbohydrates in the meal or make adjustments if the pre-meal value is above or below target. Testing two hours after the start of a meal helps a person to see how effectively they judge what was eaten or to determine if a bolus insulin dose was adequate for that meal. During times of illness, a person should test blood glucose levels at four hour intervals to determine the effect of the illness on glucose levels. A person who is visually impaired, cognitively impaired, or limited in manual dexterity needs careful evaluation of the degree to which self-monitoring of blood glucose can be formed independently. Adaptive devices are available to help patients with certain limitations. This would include talking meters and other equipment for the visually impaired. Pancreas transplants can be used as treatment option for patients with type 1 diabetes. Usually it's done for patients who have end-stage kidney disease or have had or plan to undergo a kidney transplant. Kidney and pancreas transplants are often done together or a pancreas may be transplanted after a kidney transplant. Pancreas transplants alone are rare. Successful pancreas transplants can improve the quality of life with people with diabetes, primarily by eliminating the need for exogenous insulin, frequent blood glucose measurements, and dietary restrictions imposed by diabetes. Transplant can also eliminate the acute complications experienced by patients with diabetes like hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. But pancreas transplant is only partially successful in reversing the long-term renal and neurological complications of diabetes, and the patient will require lifelong immunosuppression to prevent rejection. Complications can result from immunosuppressive therapy. Focused assessment should begin by looking at airway, breathe, and circulation. Do you see rapid, deep respirations of Kuzma's respirations? Is the patient hypotensive? Do they have a weak, rapid pulse? This could be a sign of diabetic ketoacidosis. Other focused assessment findings might be a dry mouth, vomiting, if they have a fruity breath. Are there altered reflexes? Are they restless, confused? Do they have muscle wasting? Possible diagnostics would be serum electrolyte abnormalities, a fasting blood glucose level of 126 or higher, an oral glucose tolerance test that's higher than 200, a random glucose test of 200 or higher. Patient could have leukocytosis, increased BUN and creatinine levels. Another thing to look at would be, is there an increase in triglycerides, cholesterol, LDLs? Is there a decrease in their HDL level? Is the hemoglobin A1c higher than 6? Does the patient have ketonuria, albinuria, or are they acidotic? The role of the nurse in health promotion relates to the identification, monitoring, and teaching of a patient at risk for development of diabetes. Since obesity is the primary risk factor for type 2, a moderate weight loss of 5-7% to of body weight and regular exercise of 30 minutes 5 times a week can lower the risk of developing type 2 diabetes up to 58%. Both emotional and physical stress can increase the blood glucose level and result in hyperglycemia. Because stress is unavoidable, certain situations may require intense management like extra insulin to maintain glycemic goals and avoid hyperglycemia. Acute illness, injury, and surgery are situations that may evoke a counter-regulatory hormone response resulting in hyperglycemia. Even common illnesses like viral upper respiratory infections or the flu can cause this response. Patients should report glucose levels that are higher than 300 for two tests in a row or the presence of moderate to high urine ketone levels to their health care provider. A patient with type 1 diabetes may need to increase their insulin to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis. Food intake is important during times of stress and illness because the body requires extra energy to deal with the stress of the illness. If patients are able to eat normally, they should continue with their regular meal plan while increasing the intake of non-caloric fluids. When illness causes patients to eat less than normal, they should continue to take oral hypoglycemic medications. They're non-insulin injectable agents and are insulin as prescribed while supplementing food intake with carbohydrate containing fluids such as low sodium soups, juices, and regular decaffeinated soft drinks. It is important to tell the patient to contact a health care provider if they are unable to keep down food or fluid.
During the intraoperative period, adjustments in a diabetes regimen can be planned to ensure glycemic control. A patient is given IV fluids and insulin if needed immediately before, during, and after surgery when there is no oral intake. A patient with type 2 who has been taking oral agent should understand that this is a temporary measure and should not be interpreted as a worsening of their diabetes. When caring for an unconscious surgical patient receiving insulin, be alert for hypoglycemic signs like sweating, tachycardia, and tremors. Frequent monitoring of blood glucose will prevent episodes of severe hypoglycemia. Because diabetes is a complex chronic condition, a great deal of patient contact takes place in outpatient and home settings. So the major goal of patient care in these settings is to enable the patient or caregiver to reach an optimal level of independence and self-care activities. Careful assessment of what it means to the patient to have diabetes should be the starting point of teaching. The goals of teaching should be mutually determined by the nurse and the patient based on individual needs as well as therapeutic requirements. Identify the patient's support system and include them in planning, teaching, and counseling. When family members and other individuals close to the patient are included, they can support the patient's self-care behaviors. Routine care should include regular bathing with particular emphasis given to foot care. Advise patients to inspect their feet daily, avoid going barefoot, and wear shoes that are supportive and comfortable. If cuts, scrapes, or burns occur, they should be treated promptly and monitored carefully. Patients should wash the area, apply a non-abrasive or non-irritating antiseptic ointment, and cover the area with a dry, sterile pad. They should notify the healthcare provider immediately if the injury does not begin to heal within 24 hours or if signs of infection develop. Travel for a patient with diabetes requires advanced planning. Being sedentary for long periods of time may raise a person's glucose level, so encourage the patient to get up and walk at least every two hours to prevent the risk of deep vein thrombosis and to prevent elevation of glucose levels. The patient should have a full set of diabetes care supplies in the carry-on luggage when traveling by plane, train, or bus. This includes blood glucose monitoring equipment, insulin, oral medication, syringes, or insulin pens. When equipment such as syringes, lancing devices, insulin vials or pens, and insulin pumps are taken onto a commercial liner, the professional printed pharmaceutical label should accompany them. A letter from the prescribing healthcare provider indicating medical necessity may prevent delays at security checkpoints. Notify screeners if an insulin pump is used so they can inspect it while it's on the patient's body rather than removing it. For patients who use insulin, snack items and quick-acting carbohydrate sources for treating hypoglycemia should be included in the carry-on luggage. Extra insulin should be available in case a bottle breaks or is lost. For longer trips, the patient should carry a full day supply of food in the event of canceled flights, delayed meals, or closed restaurants. If the patient is planning a trip out of the country, it's wise to have a letter from the health care provider explaining that the patient has diabetes and requires all the materials, particularly syringes, for ongoing health care. When travel involves time changes such as traveling coast to coast or across the international dateline, the patient should contact the health care provider to plan an appropriate insulin schedule. During travel, most patients find it helpful to keep their watch set at the time of city of origin until they reach their destination. The key to travel when taking insulin is to know the type of insulin being taken, its onset of action, the anticipated peak time, and meal times. Instruct the patient to carry medical identification at all times that indicates that they have diabetes. Police, paramedics, and many private citizens are aware of the need to look for this when working with sick or unconscious people. Every person with diabetes should wear a medical alert bracelet or necklace. The identification card can supply information such as the name of the health care provider, the type of diabetes, and the type and dose of insulin or oral agent. The patient should be evaluated with regard to verbalizing key elements of the therapeutic regimen, including knowledge of disease and treatment plan. Describe self-care measures that may prevent or decrease progression of chronic complications. Maintain a balance of nutrition, activity, and insulin availability that results in stable, normal blood glucose levels. Experiencing no injury resulting from decreased sensation in feet or hypoglycemia. The patient should verbalize the effects of diabetes on the peripheral artery circulation and implement measures to increase peripheral circulation.